So here we are, everybody, with our council member here, newly elected a few months ago. Reelected. Re okay, sorry. Yeah, not newly, but newly reelected. So uh, how was that campaign? It was a, a lot of work, but I, I say this is year round we're block walking, we're sending out text messages, we're hitting people with our newsletter. And so this was really affirming and that we got to talk, continue to do that work and continue to uh, hear from people and get that validation. And we were somewhat expecting a runoff, somewhat not. And I, I was grateful that in a field of 10 people, we didn't have a runoff. Ooh, so yeah. So I didn't spot a few people. That was a lot of people running in district too. Is that the largest so far? Or? No, I want to say it, last year when I had won the first time, there were 12 of us. Wow, man. Well, <laughs> you know what? At least somebody's up trying to do something. You know, don't sit back and relax. If you think they could do a better job what you're doing, come on, join the crowd. For sure. I don't think there's any shortage of leadership in our district. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll continue to see people run for office as they should because, you know, we all want to make a difference. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. So um, what are the things you're going to do in District 2 now? What do you have down the pipeline you want to do? There's a few things that we've been working on. So uh, last term, I set a record for most council consideration requests filed by a new council person uh, in a single year. And largely those were things related to civil rights or related to equity, our infrastructure, uh, environmental protections, uh, issues of discrimination and uh, predatory lending practices. And at this legislature, this past, this past session, a lot of uh, the rights and the abilities of cities was stripped a little bit. And so we're gonna have to take a, take a look at some of those requests that uh, were, in the, were in the pipeline and were in the process and saying, what, you know, what can we still work with? And what are, sort of, what are the creative workarounds of these new uh, state policies? Aside from uh, the political side, we're about to get into the city budget, which yeah. for me is super exciting because it's always an opportunity uh, to look at the way that we're allocating money for District Two's infrastructure. And for the past few years, we've been getting the most money of all districts uh, uh, for our infrastructure, including our streets, our sidewalks. And so uh, finding ways to get even more slices of the pie is my mm -hmm. goal. Um, programming for seniors, for young people. Um, and I've been prioritizing crime prevention. And so looking at funding our uh, our violence interrupters like Stand Up SA who are doing work to uh, you know, do their best to prevent a lot of the gun violence that we're seeing right now, yeah. while the state continues to make it easier and easier for people to have access to weapons. Uh, aside from that, we laid the groundwork to get a new uh, senior center. Okay. And we're in the process right now. My, I have my fingers crossed. We're trying to purchase some land right now so we can get a standalone senior center and oh. our East Side Youth Content Creator Program partnership with Alamo City Studios just got started up this week again. Mm -hmm. And so 24 students from Sam Houston High School are getting to work with industry professionals, use industry, industry grade can uh, cameras and video editing equipment. And so we have we have a lot going on right now and I'm excited to keep up with that. Oh so. man, I love hearing that. I love hearing that. Of course, one thing we could jump up and down for is uh, the Spurs. Number one draft pick. You're talking about the East Side Strong. Yes, Man, sir. I said they got the number one pick. And um, I think uh, David Robinson was number one. Tim Duncan was number one. Won championships. Now we have another number one. Looking forward to win a lot more championships. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, okay. so how how did you feel about that? that we're, we're, um, he signed, well, didn't sign, but we know he's going to. Uh, how did you feel about all the watch parties going on? The city just got... Like they won the Super Bowl. Absolutely, and it's uh, it's crazy watching yesterday when he was being interviewed at Wemby when he was being interviewed and he was like, "I'm a, I'm a spur," and you know how often do you see players who uh, attach that sense of emotion to the team that they're about to be on? like? He's excited at, as we're excited to have him, so it's it's gonna be super excited to have him in the family. I think uh, it's it's a good moment for San Antonians, and I hope that it provides some sense of benefit to the east side and we'll be working working on ways to make that happen. Yeah, well, we're here on the east side, so it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And Lindsay, if you're listening to me, we definitely need some tickets to give out next year. <laughs> Lindsay Logan with Sage, um, I teamed up with her a couple of years ago and she would send me tickets and I'll go out and, and give tickets away to kids. Now, I, I gave some tickets to um, a kid that never been to a Spurs game before. And I gave it to him. He broke down and cried. 
you know, just just for something like that and everything, you know, and that's good to have good news with them coming on. Now, my other one is, I know we're going to deep conversation with this, that railroad track on Ritterman Road. <laughs> when I saw that you reached, um, I guess, $4 million, and as we talked off camera, that's, that's just a tip. Yes. <laughs> that's not really what the real cost is going to be. But it's been a lot of drivers frustrating. I'm with this neighborhood um, deal. They go back and forth. I'm stuck by a train again. It's been an hour and a half. It's been this. But it seems like the train always come in the morning because got to be at work. And at evening at 5 o'clock, people want to get home. <laughs> are, are they running that schedule on purpose or, or what? I'll say this. Union and Pacific has been one of the worst partners to work with. And as we as the mayor is reshaping committees and making appointments, my hope is that I'll be on the transportation committee and that we can bring Union Pacific in and start having conversations about that because it's it's disrespectful at a, at a point, mm -hmm. that, especially when they stop the train for long periods of time. That's happened quite a bit as well. If I had my way, right, and this is a multi-billion dollar project, I would say reroute all the trains so that they're not going through the middle of the city because a large, the greatest community that's impacted is District 2 mm -hmm. uh, by, the, by the train. At Ritterman and Waltham and Gibbs Brawl, that area, uh, we have people who uh, just a few weeks ago called my office and they were, they called every few minutes saying, I'm here and the train is, it's been 16 minutes, it's been 27 minutes, it's been 55 minutes and they're finally moving. And that is disruptive and that's a huge quality of life issue. And so um, we've been advocating for as much money as possible to go to eliminating these railroad uh, crossings. And that four, it was about $4.8 million we got for the design. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow our public works department to prepare this project and uh, make sure that it's shovel ready so that as the federal government is announcing new opportunities uh, for uh, railroad crossing elimination programs, for example, that we have a shovel ready project that it probably ranks higher than most other cities. And so yeah. we get the 40 some odd million dollars that it's going to take to get that project done. But I think at the root of it all is that eliminating those railroad crossings are things we could we can't even do in our normal bond program. And so it's going to take federal assistance. It's going to take collaboration with our Congress members. It's going to take collaboration with the state, with Union Pacific Tech, all these entities. And it's going to be, it's going to be rough, but we're committed to it. And I'm excited for that 4.8 million. Yeah. Uh, what Was there a survey um, out saying how many cars pass through there a day? Have anything been, been done like that yet? I'm sure there's been a traffic study conducted in some way, and if, if there hasn't, it would be a part of this design process mm -hmm. uh, just to evaluate the impact. And as a part, when we're applying for federal dollars, they'll want to say, you know, this many people from this community are impacted by this many minutes on average by the, this train, and this is the positive effect it's going to have. And so I, I think that'll be a part of the report. I'm, I'm no train man or railroad man but me neither I, I know <laughs> I know a, a switching station when I see it because there's a switching station down the road in Kirby mm. and I believe that's where they attach more cars that's why it stops pull forward then back up then pull forward again then back up and, and I'm thinking that's to me they may be on the holdups right there because they're switching tracks and switching whatever they're doing right there because I know where I'm from. I'm from Illinois. And they turned around and they passed some law that a train can't come there during rush hour. Mm. You know, I don't know how they did it, but we don't worry about rush hour there. Where was that at? Up in Chicago area. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, the Chicago area, the suburbs, um, Waukegan, and Zion, North Chicago. We have a uh, train tr that comes through there. And from what I gathered, um, they can't come through there during rush hour. I'll have to figure out what kind of because Illinois and Texas politics are fairly different and mm -hmm. uh, the jurisdictions of cities are fairly different. And so I'd have to see if that's a possibility. I, Based on the way the relationship has been with Union Pacific, I've gathered that we have very little uh, input. Wow. And I actually had a conversation last week with um, newly elected Mayor uh, Janisha Greider of Kirby. Mm -hmm. And we were both like, we were talking about the train. We were talking about the impact because she she borders right there. Mm -hmm. And I think that the next conversation that we're going to have is going to be with our congressman, uh, Greg Kassar, to see what opportunities are there are there at the federal level to not just handle the railroad crossing at Ritterman and Walsham, but take it a little bit further to Gibbs Brawl and 
mm -hmm. right, all those areas. Because if you go down a little further, some people will go ahead and they'll go around, go up on their bridge, go through curb and come around it. Some will go straight on down and hit walls them. But if the train is long enough, mm -hmm. you're stuck right there too. Mm -hmm. So barns, emergency happens. Yeah. There's no way emergency vehicles get through. So there's been issues where uh, there's part, I forget what neighborhood it is, but it's on the Northeast and they are on a slope. So there's a big dip of water and say they're, and they're at the top. And on the other side of them is the railroad. And so if there was an emergency, say we flooded on one side and they had to get somewhere and there was a train, train stop, they wouldn't be able to get any sort of relief. They couldn't access medical facilities. They couldn't find safety. They'd be stuck there. And so mm -hmm. at, at a certain point, it does become a huge health hazard and emergency. And yeah. we need to do as much as we can to eliminate that. Mm -hmm. You think some of the um, deregulation dere hurt? Or, or Pacific just don't want to work with us? I think Union Pacific just doesn't want to work with us. And every time we have conversations with them, I know State Representative Gerwin Hawkins has had conversations with them, and it just falls on deaf ears. They just they they have the power. They have the they are steering the ship at that point, and oh man, they're just doing what is profitable to them. Yeah, you know what? You hit them where, where the pocketbooks at. They'll they'll straighten up. <laughs> yeah, one, 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 yeah. <laughs> the other one is is the housing prices. Um, I talked to a few people. Um, the matter of fact, they gave me their concerns is they got some houses that are brand new over there. And they say some houses, two houses taking up one lot. Uh, how is that possible? So there are, so with zoning, there are certain, uh, man, I'm trying to, I want to say this in the most concise way. There are different uh, zoning criteria. So if someone is zoned one way, and their lot just so happens to be sized a certain a certain amount, they can fit two properties depending on the acreage and depending mm -hmm. on the size of the, the, of the units. It also depends on, you know, previously we saw a lot of zoning changes where council members would say, you know, we need the density, we need uh, this developer wants to work with us and wants to help redevelop our community. So we're gonna allow them to build a little bit more on this one property. And so a lot of these larger parcels got split up into smaller ones through zoning changes. And what we saw was that that didn't lead to any relief in terms of uh, affordability. It didn't make it so that housing became more affordable. It actually did quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it made it so that all of these tiny shotgun homes are valued at ridiculous amounts, $300,000, $400,000 mm -hmm. right next to a $100,000 home. And what we're then seeing is the appraisal district going ahead and comparing both of those two houses and saying, you know, these are comparable because this one is big, this one's little. And so this this val this home that was once 100,000 is now worth 250, 300, 400,000 over a period of time. And yeah. so we're, we just voted, uh, today is Friday. Mm -hmm. We just voted yesterday to uh, extend our homestead exemption from 10% to 20%. So that's going to be a little bit of property tax relief. But what we really need to see is at the appraisal district, uh, those folk who are conducting appraisals, we need transparency in that process. And we need, mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly, we need reform in that because there's no way that a home that's a hundred years old and worth a hundred thousand dollars a few years ago should be worth 400,000 now just yeah. because a new house popped up next to it. That's not like California. You get a house out there, a two bedroom home, uh, it's almost a million dollars. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so with, with that taking place, so if somebody wants to sell that house as $100,000 and turn around and sell $400,000, between me and you and a dog named Blue, nobody's going to buy that house for $400,000. Exactly. exactly. So they're stuck with high appraisal rates. High appraisal rates and then the high property taxes and the mm -hmm. rising cost of living. All of, the, all of these things are factors, are factors that are distinctly affecting District 2 in the inner city where we're seeing developers yeah. come in and for the past several decades exploit our communities. And so mm -hmm. I've been uh, I've been opposed to accepting developer dollars. I wanted people to be clear, like you can't come in here and treat the district the way you've been treating it. And I think that's that shapes the way that you know developers interact with me and the way that they talk about the relationship they, with, that they have with District 2. And some have gone as far to say, we're not going to do any projects in Government Hill until 
Jalen's out of office and it's okay. Well, if these are the kinds of projects you were going to be doing, then we don't, we don't need you, <laughs> you know, forget that. So our lots, uh, some developers I heard through the grapevine are coming from California. They're coming from everywhere they're doing. So one of the biggest issues we have here in Texas and in San Antonio is uh, these corporations. <laughs> Sorry. There are these corporations that are purchasing lots of land, not doing with anything with them, sitting on them for a while. And then, Sorry, it's all right. It's... So there, there's these corporations from out of state that are coming in and they're purchasing these lots of land throughout the throughout the city mm. and not doing anything with them, waiting for them to, uh, waiting for them to rise in value, and then they're finally going to develop and change the landscape of the city. But and there's very little that the state has done to address that, and that's a huge problem. Yeah, boy, I tell you, those are the ones the questions I got. Um, somebody else asked about, we talked about already is, um, Brackenridge Park. They were unaware that it was split in half between, um, district one, one, one and two. So it's still split in half. Is that a good thing? Is that revenue that district two get from the park or? Um, I'll say it's a good thing in that Brackenridge Park has a very significant history to our community and to the black community in San Antonio. And if it were to be, and the way it works now is we have a whole bunch of money going into Brackenridge Park uh, mm -hmm. through the bond and through private interest and development. The zoo is located there. Sunken Garden Theater is located there. And there's a bunch of development that's going to be taking place. And because it's split between District 1 and 2, both council members and their, and their respective neighborhoods get an opportunity to weigh in. There was, a, there was a targeted effort to remove it from District 2 so that only the District 1 council person would have any influence or say, and they could go around it. And it, was, it goes back to that relationship with developers. Yeah. Because of the, you know, because of the testimony of residents, because I made this a concern on the dais when it was first brought up to us, you know, I think it became clear that District 2 wasn't having it. And so we got, yeah. everything stayed pretty much status quo. So District 2 was uh, one of the only districts that didn't change after redistricting and we got to keep on portion of that. So basically we're not hearing it. I'm hearing it. They, they like picking on you. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's not a it's not a personal thing with me right it's there's been people in special interests who have gotten to exploit and take advantage of district two for ever mm -hmm. and it's taken a it's taken a very targeted effort to say we're not having that anymore i'm going to be here for a while and you're going to have to change the way that you behave and the way that you treat my district or you won't get anything Mm -hmm. And so there, I think this term is when we're going to start to see the shift because there were a lot of people who were waiting me out, waiting to see if that turnover was going to keep repeating because it's been 10 years since District 2 has repeated, uh, has reelected someone for a second full term. They thought that I was going to be gone. Yeah. And now that I'm here again, they're realizing, okay, fine, I guess we do have to work with you. And I guess we do have to listen to the concerns mm -hmm. and the complaints and we have to you know, try to tailor our approach. And so I'm interested in seeing what that looks like this term and if they got the message or not, or if they are a little slow on it. <laughs> could it, could it seem like with District 2 with the Blacks, they gave us kibbles and bits and we were satisfied with that, but that's over with now. We want some of the pie, Absolutely. no kibbles and bits. We want what, what we should have got years ago. And you're seeing through that and you're seeing that, okay, ho, 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 pump your brakes. That's going to stop. This is this is what we're gonna do right now, and um, but that's that's what we're looking forward to. Now, my other thing, my concern is, I stay two blocks from being in District Two. Yeah. Two blocks. We're not even the city of San Antonio. We got Wingcrest, Kirby, San Antonio, and a sliver of Bear County. And are you in Converse or are you in Kirby? I'm in neither. I'm in between both of them. I'm right in the middle where we're just Bear County, mm -hmm. but we pay city taxes and we're Bear County. And we got a Bear, we got a San Antonio address. You know, the address is in San Antonio, but we're in that little sliver right there where if we go three blocks that direction, we're in Converse. We go two blocks this direction, we're in San Antonio. If we go a little further, we're in um, Kirby. Mm -hmm. So we're just stuck right there in the middle because what dawned on me at the time to vote for the mayor when Ivy was running, Ivy Taylor was running. We went to go vote. They told us we could. And I said, what? What do you mean we can't vote here? You're not in the city of San Antonio. Mm. So, 
Well, I, you'll have to give me your address and we'll have to see what that is. Because we've had some, we've had, we've had some conversations about annexing different parts of, you know, the areas around District 2. So I'm, I'd be interested in seeing what that looks like. And Yeah. If you, we, if you look at the map, you break it down. We're in this little arrow, little narrow pathway <laughs> of Bear County. That's it. That, you know, so that, that's been my main concern. Um, I talked to Tommy Covert about it, too. And um, he's a commissioner for four, right? Mm -hmm. And I talked to him about it one time. He said, they're going to change that. But that was um, two years ago when I talked to him. I okay. know things take time. I know they do. At one time, Kirby was thinking about annexing um, uh, Sunrise. Mm -hmm. But that never happened. You know, we always hear what's going on, but nothing ever happened. So I, I'll say it would be a mistake for Kirby to annex Sunrise with me now because we're about to... That's one of those areas of the district for those who aren't familiar with sunrise it's on the northeast side it borders kirby and their entire almost they're in all of their streets are in complete disrepair it's one of the darkest parts of the city with a lack of street lighting and uh we've been working with the neighbor and we're about to be investing quite a bit because uh what people don't realize is a mile of a, a failing street is about two million dollars mm. so repair sunshine to repair sunrise alone would talk we're talking about six million dollars in street repair and we're about i think we're about to start making that and i've seen them move up in the imp and so over the course of the next few years they're going to be getting quite a bit of investment okay i noticed what on on our list but i gotta ask this question um fiber optic google mm -hmm. um they're not in their area either <laughs> i can't win seeing where i'm at I like where i'm at but i did find out the other day um reading i don't know how i find this information if you bring in fiber optic, Google is coming that direction. Mm -hmm. I watched them the other day putting fiber octet down. Yes, sir. And it went right on the main road on, on Wood Lake, right on the main road, right by our house. I said, oh, good. So maybe we're going to get it over here because mm -hmm. all we got is one internet provider, and that's um, Spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's it. So we're stuck with them. I have nothing bad to say about them. Uh, not at all, but just. I've had my challenges. I, but, but I'm not paying all that money <laughs> for fast internet. You know, I start off at twenty nine dollars. Now it's up to sixty nine. It seems like, and then they justify why they're raising the price, and I don't see no just. Don't give me COVID again for the internet being raised. I'm tired of people using COVID to raise prices, and they they, they have been doing that well. I, do you know anything about Google the Fiber? Is, the new thing is supply and demand. That's yeah. been one of the biggest issues. But um, I do know that they're working on kind of you know. They're hitting certain areas and they're trying to do it equitably throughout the city. So they're moving and they're applying it here. And then they're mm -hmm. going to the next district and going in sort of a counterclockwise motion as they apply it. But the goal is to fully connect all residents in San Antonio and the near and the uh, metropolitan metropolitan area with uh, Google Fiber. Okay, I just uh, that wasn't on the deal, but I had to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, that question I had to ask. Um, the last thing um, is the um, LGBTQ. I, I was talking to you earlier that this one guy came and told me the reason why I messed with him because they're soft target. I said, are you kidding me? What you did, you woke up a sleepy giant. That's what happened. So with, with that being said, it's, I don't get it why people are so, so hated about things that's going on. I, I don't get it. I mean, you hear about it all the time on the news. And you shouldn't have to hear anything like that. This is 2023. Mm -hmm. Why are we hearing things like this going on right now? I'll touch on a few things. And one is, you know, it's Pride Month, which is uh, an anniversary of the Stonewall riots when uh, police were coming in and they were brutalizing the LGBTQ community. And uh, I think it was uh, Marsha P. Johnson threw a, threw a brick at Stonewall and it became this uh, big, and that was the starting point for a riot that became known as Pride. And we've continued that tradition. And I, I'm I'm honored to be the first openly gay man elected to San Antonio and the first openly gay black man elected to any office in Texas. And when I was running for office, people thought that District 2 would, would never elect a young gay man. And what we saw was that I won handily and I got reelected again. And so I think what we're seeing at the state is a little bit of that ignorance towards, you know, what does the community find socially acceptable and what does the community uh, embrace and love and who are we as a people? And they think that, 
you know, by embracing these culture wars, issues of immigration, issues of the LGBTQ community, targeting LGBTQ and trans kids, uh, mm -hmm. saying you can't compete in sports, you can't, uh, you can't use your pronouns in the classroom, teachers have to report X, Y, Z thing. Um, we're seeing that, you know, I, I was a teacher before I got elected and my last year of teaching right before in that that last year was during the pandemic. And so students were already dealing with the mental health issues related to being isolated, being at home, being away from friends. And I had six students who had attempted suicide that were all members of the LGBTQ community. Oh man. And what people don't realize is that these attacks that are happening at the state, you know, they impact our students. The way that we talk about uh, the LGBTQ community, the way that we talk about trans kids and trans people and LGBTQ people, that translates to the way that our children think we feel about them. Mm -hmm. And it's causing them to kill themselves. And so I, I think just as a message to everyone, you don't have to understand all the time. You don't have to relate. But I think compassion and kindness goes a long way. Yes. It's much needed today in our society. It does. It goes a long way. Compassion is the key right there because so a lot they are so rude and ruthless and thinking that we're not going to say anything. You know, enough is enough. I'm going to say it. I'm going to go ahead and say it. When you get the old, tired people that have been in office for years, mainly is the whites, they want to run things the way they see things. The problem with that is they don't see our culture or understand our culture. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the black culture. Um, the uh, Crown Law was just passed. The Crown Act, yes. The Crown yeah. Act was just passed because I followed that closely because it was a friend of mine. That was so exciting. She came home from work. She she called and said, what's going on, Ron? They sent me home from work because of my hair. I said, they did what? They sent me home because of my hair. I said, our hair is not straight and you cut. No, they don't understand the culture. And that's, and that's exactly it. It's, uh, and I'll go back to being a teacher again and 1% of educators are black men. Mm -hmm. There's a larger percentage of black women who are teachers, but it's still very small. And so if you think about how many of our children throughout the country, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, mm -hmm. how many of them have black teachers? How many of them grow up you know, knowing black people? And how many of them are isolated from the black community? And these are people who are isolated and don't understand the culture, have never been a part of it, don't understand the issues and struggles and history. And then they go on to become leaders in companies. They go on to become politicians and policy makers. And I had, I remember when I introduced the support for the Crown Act at the city council, I had one of my colleagues who was a white man and he was saying, you know, I had no idea that this was an issue mm -hmm. and I'm inclined to support because there's people who are impacted by hair discrimination that came to me, told me their real life experience and mm -hmm. so I have no choice but to believe it. But yeah. what's wrong, and, and is I'm glad that it passed this time. Last time it didn't pass, last session it didn't pass. But people tend to, you'll see if you read articles about it, there tends to be comments that, oh, hair discrimination, why do we even need to protect that? What does that even mean? Is that even happening? And it's, you know, especially black women are telling you, mm -hmm. you know, they're, we had young women from the lemonade circle, teenagers, freshmen through, junior seniors in high school mm -hmm. talking about their experience growing up and facing hair discrimination mm -hmm. and feeling the the uh, pressure to apply heat and chemicals and permanently damage their hair because they're not being accepted or treated fairly by their teachers who are white men who are white women and that's mm -hmm. it's it's all cyclical it's all a problem it's like um the wrestler a few years ago the um um the referee didn't like his hair. They cut his hair right there on the spot. Yes, Ooh. it blocks. Right? Yes. Yeah, that was me. They couldn't I, hold me back long. <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't mess with my kid like Absolutely. that. You judging my kid because you don't. Yeah, yeah. Now, this one lady, I'm going to give her her I'd problem. be there with clippers for everyone. <laughs> she's my <all> ball-headed. <laughs> <laughs> Come here. <laughs> uh, there's a friend of mine who does locks. Her name is Devette. I don't know if you know her. Um, she's got it. What she does... Um, she talks to little black girls who like doing hair, and she tells them, you could do this for a living. And she takes and trains them to learn how to do locks. To learn how to, that was a shameless plug to vet, so you owe me some money. Um, but this is what she does. She's in the black community, and she can't stand it. When that happens, she brings the girls in and show them, because it's an art. Can't anybody get down there and do it? It's an art. 
it's a culture arc. I'm going to say that. that's exactly what it is. So um, she does a good job in, in relating to the other young ladies out there. And um, uh, who's the lady with the lemon? Um, Brandy yeah, Brandy. I, I talked to her a while back. She's going to be on the show somewhere down the line. So um, we, we talked We talked already, so I'm going to get her on the show. But, you know, things like that, people got to understand. Um, if you don't understand our culture, you can't tell us what to do. But they feel that they can. They feel straight up they can do it. So at that point, I got one last question for you. Yes, sir. What can the community do for District 2? Well, there's, uh, there's, people always want, 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 want. What can we give? Like right now, what I'm giving is this platform for anybody to come on and talk about your business, anything in the black community. But what can the community give to District 2? I think there's a, a few different ways to answer this question. I'll think from a, from a government perspective, my role as a council person, uh, my influence and my power is strengthened on the dais when there's members of my community who stand up and they come to public comment, they complete surveys and they let their voice be heard and the things that I'm saying on the dais are reflected by my community and my constituents. And so that's always an opportunity and always something that I encourage. I think the other side of that is there's power in organizing and there's power in the collective people coming together and saying, you know, this is the this is what we want to see for our community. This is the kind of community we want to live in. Um, and so I'm thinking specifically, right? I, I want to talk about an issue that everyone is top of mind for everyone and it's safety and it's gun violence. And it's our young people who are involved in uh, very reckless behavior and the kind of retaliatory shootings that are taking place where we're losing family members left and right. And I wonder how as a community, can we and are we embracing our young people, embracing those who are, you know, maybe don't feel like they're succeeding in high school, don't know what their life is going to be like. Maybe they're impoverished. Maybe they're lonely and maybe they don't have a father figure. Maybe they don't have family. How are we embracing our young people and making and letting them know it's wrong to participate in these kinds of things? How are we letting them know that they're loved and that this is our community and that, you know, we take care of one another here. Mm -hmm. And that's a cultural shift that I think needs to happen. And it's not cultural by race, it's cultural by geographic proximity. Mm -hmm. culturally by, you know, we are all living under very similar conditions on the east and northeast side of San Antonio. And so how are we protecting one another and being there for one another and sort of regaining that sense of community that once existed where everyone knew their neighbors, everyone knew yes. that if your kid was out on the street, somebody was watching them, you weren't the only one watching them. Mm -hmm. How do we rebuild that? And so I think yes. as a community, I think what we can do is we can all brainstorm that and we all think about what is our role gonna be in getting back to that. And I, my team and I have conversations about this all the time, but I really don't, I don't fully know. Well, back in the days so when I was going, growing up, yeah, I'm old. Um, if you did something down the block before a few years apart. Okay. <laughs> before you got home, mom knew about it. This is before pagers, cell phones, all they knew about it. That's because we were raised as a village. Mm -hmm. Everybody could discipline somebody's kid down there doing something wrong. It wasn't if you touch my kid again, I'm gonna shoot you. That's where we're at now. But before, you know, if you know you did something wrong, oh you dread going home because you know your parents already know what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's what we're missing. Is that connection right there? I did say I have one last question. That was the last question, but I still have one more. Uh, when I seen um, Sonia walk in, <laughs> she had a question. Um, they have summertime deals for kids between five and 10, and then teenagers. But she want to know, there, are there any programs for people 11 to 15? Mm. Are there anything out there like that? I'll have to look. I want to say, I mean, I. I would find it really challenging to say no. I think okay. there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of partners, and I'll I'll stick specifically to District Two. Right, is we have the museum, we have the zoo, we have uh, museums and arts and arts exhibits and those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, and they always tell us that they're looking for ways to you know capture those kids, especially between eleven and fifteen and younger. And there are. There are, and I'll have to, we'll have to touch base about it. Like, okay, okay. Because I don't want to say anything wrong. I'll yeah, because <laughs> she has a daughter. She wants to put, like, there's camps like there or a place they go to during the day. One of my, uh, a member of my staff has a daughter who's 13, and she's participating in 
summer camps right now at the Carver at the Carver Cultural Center. Okay. And so I know they had they had stuff, but so I'll, I'll touch base with you on on opportunities. Okay. That was Sonia right there who asked that question. <laughs> she wanted to know. <laughs> and so, but I want to make sure um, that I got input from the people, not just my questions. I got input from everybody else that, that wants to know what's going on because not just me. It's about everybody out there because some questions you ask the people are scared to ask, but there's always one person who asks that question. Oh, when I was working, nobody asked questions. I said, oh, yeah, because we knew you was going to answer, Ronald. I said, yeah, you're about right on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I want to interview you. Interview me? Yes, sir. Okay. Never been asked that before. No, I've never been asked that before. <laughs> so you're going to interview me, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. we'll get that. We'll get that together, and I'm going to give you no questions. I'm going to answer everything Perfect. as honestly and as possible. I'm going to be as transparent as possible. Perfect. You know, because that's just how it is, right? That's going to hope y'all tune in for that. Yeah, you hear that? You hear that? I'm going to be interviewed. Oh, some of you have been chomping at this one. No, are you going to ever get interviewed? I said, no. Well, we're changing that now. Yeah, I see that right now. <laughs> Jalen, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you for 